Could life have started from simply natural processes? Little bit of chemistry here, dash of physics there, a lot of time, and boom, we've got the beginning of life, abiogenesis, right? We've already detailed a number of serious issues with abiogenesis in these videos. But just like your favorite superhero movie, let's briefly ignore the laws of physics. We'll just assume that all of the scientific challenges mentioned in those prior videos have been vaporized. So, we now have lots of building blocks, biopolymers, and a cell membrane that is fully equipped to maintain homeostasis. Awesome. We still wouldn't have life yet, because life is built around something called gradients. A gradient is basically more of something over here, and less of it over there. The opposite of a gradient is equilibrium. Physics loves equilibriums, but not so much gradients. For instance, water likes to be in equilibrium, all spread out evenly. But if you build a dam, you can create a gradient, collecting a bunch of water on one side, and not a lot of water on the other side. The water naturally wants to flow down from the high side to the low side, and this is where energy can be harnessed. Life does the same thing, except instead of water, cells use proton gradients to capture energy. It's super important. No gradients, no life. To advance further toward life, we would need a continuous supply of these energy gradients and a way to harness them. Some scientists claim that there were plenty of energy sources to support the first proto-life forms. Hydrothermal vents, the sun, lightning, hydrothermal vents, volcanoes, hydrothermal Is it really the case that life could have started with these kinds of energy sources? Let's take a closer look. It's true, the universe has plenty of raw energy out there, but there's a very important difference between that and what life can actually use to exist. Life is pretty picky. It needs very specific kinds of energy, and it needs to be fed it in a very particular kind of way. Otherwise... It's kind of like trying to charge your cell phone with a charcoal grill. There's lots of energy in the grill, but none of it is usable for your poor dying phone. To harness the raw energy of the grill into something your phone can use, you would need a set of pretty complex machines. A boiler to heat water into steam, a turbine that the steam pressure can spin, an electric generator, then transformers, converters, regulators to get the energy in just the right form. And then you need the right kind of charger plug thing for your phone. And if you're lucky, the cable's long enough so that you can lay in bed while it charges and not at some weird angle. But, like life, your cell phone isn't just picky, it's also fragile. Not only will the grill not charge your cell phone, but it'll also destroy it. If the little circuits and bits in your cell phone get too much energy, or even a little bit of the wrong kind of energy, it's done for. Oh, battery's almost dead, let's get you some energy. Energy! 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 Raw forms of energy can only be used for life if complex machines are available to harness them. And the wrong kind of energy will destroy life. Okay, maybe life didn't get started in a volcano. How about just nearby? Hydrothermal vents are a perfect example. They're a great source of constant energy gradients that early life could have used. Hydrothermal vents aren't like lightning. They're more of a gentle, sustained energy source. Yeah, that is true, but living things can't just absorb energy like a sponge, even if it is gentle. Even the simplest forms of life harness energy through a three-step process. The fancy term for this process is romantically known as First, three proton pumping complexes known by the friends as NADH ubiquinone oxyreductase, coenzyme Q cytochrome C oxyreductase, and cytochrome C oxidase. These guys are also known as the respiratory complexes and together are made of about 25 different proteins, each of which is very fancy in its own regard, consisting of hundreds of precise amino acids. Anyway, these proton complexes use electrons that are stripped off the cell's food source to power machines that pump protons, known as proton pumps resulting in fewer protons inside the membrane and more protons outside, which conveniently provides an electrical voltage, or a gradient. The respiratory complexes have to be complex because stripping electrons is a dangerous process, like handling a bomb. If any of the 15 reaction steps in this process are mishandled, the loose electrons will destroy the first molecule they encounter. 
but physics is pretty unhappy about these protons getting kicked out of the cell membrane club and wants to shove them back in. So, step two. The disgraced protons are only allowed back into the cell if they first turn an electric generator called ATP synthase. In the simplest form of life, ATP synthase is a machine made from at least 20 interconnecting proteins, and it requires other proteins to help assemble it too. Complexity upon complexity. Nick Lane, an origin of life researcher and biochemist at University College London, describes ATP synthase as the most impressive nanomachine of them all. It is hard to convey the astonishing complexity of this protein motor. This is precision engineering of the highest order. A magical device, and the more we learn about it, the more marvelous it becomes. Rotation of this ATP synthase motor is used to recharge dead batteries, ADP, turning them into ATP. It doesn't look all that complicated until you realize it looks more like this. And this is slowed down by more than tenfold. And the cell membrane is so densely packed with these machines, they effectively make the entire surface of the membrane. Step three, the charged up ATP is plugged into a wide variety of other biological machines to power all the living stuff we need to do, like building proteins, repairing DNA, replication, cell division, blinking, subscribing to this YouTube channel, you name it. When the ATP is discharged and turned into ADP, it gets sent back to the ATP synthase to get charged up again. Fun fact, a typical human generates and uses roughly 1 billion trillion ATP molecules per second. That's your entire body weight in ATP every single day. Whoa. Here's the paradox. The cell needs to make ADP, the empty batteries of life, before they can be charged up to ATP and put to use. But producing one new empty battery requires at least seven already charged batteries. So you can't make ADP until you already have ATP around in the cell. And ATP is required to build ATP synthase. But ATP synthase is required to charge ADP into ATP. So life's energy harnessing process is one big paradox. You need it before you can have it and you can't make it until you've already made it. Every part had to arrive, assemble, and start working all at once, leaving no time for it to gradually develop. Hang on a second. Hydrothermal vents are supposed to solve some of these problems, though. There are two types of hydrothermal vents. The first are called black smokers, and they do provide raw energy and some very simple molecules that early life would have needed. But on the other hand, black smokers are too hot and too toxic. Any organic compounds that form at these temperatures would quickly degrade back to CO2. They're also very unstable, growing and collapsing over a few decades at most. Not nearly enough time for anything useful to happen, even if it could. They're not seriously seen as a solution to the problem of chemical evolution. The other kind of hydrothermal vents are called white smokers. These are instead proposed to be the solution. They're not as hot, and they're better suited for harnessing energy because of a free pH gradient. And the rock structure provides tiny membrane-like compartments for fledging life to take root. There are a few big problems with white smokers as well, though. A simple cell requires 100 million times the energy density that could be produced by these alkaline vents. And as you probably guess, rocks make poor membranes. The rocky membranes in alkaline vents are hundreds of times thicker than the membranes of life. The pH gradient across such a thick membrane would not provide enough useful energy for life. So rather than protecting and nurturing life, these white smokers would strangle it out instead. The high pH also removes the carbon that life needs and is destructive to RNA, and on top of all of that, we would still need complex machines to harness the energy. White smokers do nothing to solve that problem, and scientists are well aware of this difficulty. But life started in a much simpler form. It didn't have to start with something so complex like chemiosmotic coupling. Just look at fermenters or methanogens and acetogens. For harnessing energy in life, fermentation is the only known alternative to chemiosmotic coupling. It produces a small amount of ATP through a simpler process called substrate-level phosphorylation. But this kind of fermentation is not sustainable. You see, strict fermenters pollute their environment, which quickly stops them from growing or reproducing, unless their waste is cleaned up by other forms of life that use chemiosmotic coupling. So this effort to simplify only increases the total complexity. 
Methanogens and acetogens don't use respiratory complexes to produce their proton gradients, but they still require complex enzymes to produce a proton gradient, and they still rely on the incredibly complex ATP synthase to generate their ATP. So again, this doesn't really simplify the problem. Okay, what if earlier life didn't use ATP? Then it would just need a different set of complex machines to harness whatever other energy it used. Then you would have to explain how those machines transformed into the machines that all of life uses today. In case it needs to be said, there's no evidence for this, but more importantly, it actually makes the problem worse. But we've got lots of time. Time won't help you because you can't store ATP. These things are so unstable, particularly around hydrothermal vents, it'll basically decay instantly. And it's hard to overstate how much ATP is needed every second of every day in order to sustain life. Even if aliens dumped off a big tanker of ATP, it wouldn't help if we didn't have the machines to plug it into or a way to recharge it. Life requires a continuous supply of energy that must be converted into just the right form by a series of complex molecular machines. And the complex molecular machines themselves could only have been produced by an established energy harnessing process. This is yet another paradox for the origin of life. Imagining that life started simpler and had lots of time to accomplish this is a half-baked idea, like trying to charge your cell phone on a charcoal grill. Hey, if you like this video, click that like button and make sure you're subscribed for more. Also, take a moment to check out some of these other videos on the origin of life and evolution. Thanks.